I began writing when I was about 18 or 19, and uh, whether it made me or I made it, I just don't know which happened. You know? Brian Friel was born in Tyrone in 1929. His father was a Derry school teacher, his mother a postmistress from Glenties in County Donegal. Friel has spoken little about his work and less about his life. In 1970, however, Ivan Boland asked him about the early years. Was the Tyrone you grew up in uh, an unsettled place or was it uh, a society where a Catholic could live easily? Well, I left there when I was 10 years of age, uh, reared in a very traditional Catholic nationalist um, home. Uh, I came to Derry in 1939 when war was beginning and uh, we believed then that uh, Germany was right and that England was wrong, you know, this kind of an attitude. Friel's secondary school education was at St. Columns College in Derry. He went on to work as a teacher in and around the city, writing short stories throughout the 50s and some stage works in the early 60s. The real breakthrough, however, came after a trip to Tyrone Guthrie's Theatre in Minneapolis. I first saw Philadelphia Here I Come in the 1964 production by Hilton Edwards with uh, Donald Donnelly and Patrick Bedford and Eamon Kelly and Maureen D. O'Sullivan and, um, and a wonderful, wonderful Irish cast. Current artistic director of the Guthrie Theatre, Joe Dowling. That production was my introduction to Brian Friel and I think many people's introductions to Brian Friel, though he had written a couple of plays before. Um, it, was, it, it broke so many of the of the the moulds of Irish dramatic literature. I mean, we had all become used to the idea of the kitchen drama, the 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 Abbey play, where the the um, housekeeper and the priest and and the postmaster and all the various characters would come in, and and there would be a sense of of absolute naturalism about it. And what Friel did with with Philadelphia, I come in creating those two characters. I mean, Gar private and Gar public, both aspects, different aspects of the one man. Um, was to absolutely turn the Irish country cottage play on its head. Um, it also, of course, struck a chord, a deep, deep chord in the Irish people because emigration had been and continued in 1964 and right through up till fairly recently to be a major, major part of Irish life. So many people had to emigrate and go abroad and never came back. I mean, the whole notion of the of the American wake that's so extraordinary in in, in Brian's play um, so when when it played in New York in that original production, of course, it was it was a sensational success. And so to bring it back, as I had the opportunity to do in the early 90s in, in, in New York, and then subsequently I did a production of it at the Guthrie Theatre, where um, uh, indeed Brian had been um, Tyrone Guthrie's observer. He'd been an observer at the very first season here in 1963. Brian... Um, uh, came from Ireland and spent the summer here uh, when Guthrie was putting his first season together. And he wrote to me when, Brian, when we were uh, mounting the play in my first season here in 1996, and he said uh, in that that he had gone home from the Guthrie Theatre on a Guthrie High and written Philadelphia Here I Come. So in so many ways when I did it um, at the Guthrie as part of my first season, it felt like bringing the play home where he had conceived it and where it had, uh, where, where on a Guthrie High he had gone home and written it. Friel followed Philadelphia Here I Come with The Loves of Cass Maguire, which had its American premiere in 1966 and its Irish premiere in 1967. While Cass may not have been as successful as Philadelphia, it played an unusual role in the beginnings of an important Irish theatre company. Well, um, Brian Friel is, is responsible, um, whether he likes it or not, and I'm sure he doesn't, for my introduction into the theatre. Artistic Director of Druid, Gary Hines. When I joined Drama Sock in, in uh, UCG in 1971, I had been bitten with the idea of directing uh, by that stage. And so I went up to the UCG library and I went to the plays for the first time and I ferreted around there and I eventually pulled out this play called The Loves of Cass Maguire and I was immediately captivated by the play. I was immediately captivated by the fact that he broke the fourth wall, that the character talked to the audience, that characters uh, entered and emerged to the audience, that other characters broke in, that Cass broke in on other scenes and just simply, I just found it tremendously exciting. So you know, with all the naivety of a 19 or 20 year old, which I was at the time, I said, that's the play I'm going to do. Well, I have a very special affection and feeling for Brian Friel for a very simple reason. Actor Neil Tobin. 
it was when I was offered the part of Andy in Lovers. I was a member of the staff of the RTE rep. I just read this play and I said, well, I, I've got to do it. And uh, I was told I wouldn't be given permission to come out and do it. So I said, well, to hell with it. And I resigned. And I went into this production in the gate with Hilton and with myself and Anna Manahan. There, were, there are two parts of the play, as you know. Very, very moving, of course, as well. Heartbreaking, the second part. It was really hard. Well, the first one is is uh, superficially heartbreaking as well as being heartbreaking, but the second one is, is very, very moving, I think, and uh, I loved playing it. In 1973, Freel turned to matters of an overtly political nature in the freedom of the city. At the time, he spoke with Des Hickey about this perceived change of emphasis. Well, I suppose uh, on a kind of superficial level, it would appear to be a more... Um, in quote social play it would appear to have more to do with an immediate situation which is political and uh, in a way revolutionary but I, th I think that uh, this is only a kind of superficial look at the theme because it really has to do with um, people who are in a sense um, dispossessed uh, and I think this kind of theme can be traced back in earlier plays I've written as well Is this though a theme that you have um, avoided before? Well, I avoided in a kind of way um, using immediate political happenings um, uh, and grabbing headings from newspapers in that sense. Uh, but this play was in a way uh, kind of peculiar because it began as a 19th century, a play set in the 19th century and having to do with an eviction. Uh, and it was entitled at that point John Butts Bothy and uh, was getting nowhere. Uh, and then certain political events happened in the north um, I don't think any one event, but a, a, a kind of concentration of events over a fair long period of time, and, and the play somehow, in this kind of atmosphere, found a focus and uh, ended up in the shape that it is now. In 1979, Friel went to the big house for his inspiration. I, I happen to think Aristocrats is one of Brian's um, most accomplished plays. I mean, people talk about it having a Chekhovian atmosphere and so it does there are three sisters and a brother and and um there's a, a, a kind of quiet desperation about their lives that uh, is very jacobian but of course it's also um a very original piece of work the the uh, character of casimir um is one of brand's great creations this kind of desperately um, frightened shy man whom we don't really know whether the world he's created for himself in germany is real or not and whether the, um, uh, the 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 future that he sort of talks about can ever happen. He lives in a in a in a very strange uh, world of of the memories of the family, how it's declined, and how he uh, has has declined with it. And then you also have in that play that wonderful juxtaposition of the big house, the Catholic big house, which is a rarity in in Irish life. Um, that Catholic big house and the peasantry. The boy brought up in the village, Eamon, um, versus Casimir, and that whole sense of of how the world of that uh, aristocratic Catholic um, Ireland was crumbling so fast, and and the the rise of the peasantry. I mean, there's, there there are there are marvelous things in in aristocrats, um, not to mention, of course, the music. I mean, to actually choose the Chopin and to have the youngest daughter Claire play it throughout the play. And and he carefully in the script, very, very carefully, determines where that music will come. And the great thing about Brian Friel in terms of how he uses music and how he uses all those elements of uh, theatricality is he's never, ever wrong. It always works. Claire is a, a girl with huge talent, but has inherited perhaps her mother's fragility. Actress Ingrid Craigie played Claire in the original production of Aristocrats. She plays the piano throughout and she's going to get married to a much older man who we hope will take care of her, but you know it's going to be really a bit of a disaster. When we were doing Aristocrats in 1978, uh, 79, Brian was absent from some of the rehearsal because he was in New York mounting the original production of Faith Healer with James Mason and his wife Clarissa Kay and Donald Donnelly. And... Um, as we all know now, it was that first production was not a not a success, and I think there were many reasons for that. Directed by Jose Quintero, it was a production that was put into a theatre that was way too large for it. And while 
Brian has always argued that that uh, James Mason, in fact, w- did well in the play. It just somehow didn't connect with its audience. And he came back somewhat depressed by this experience, as, as you can imagine, because here was a play he believed, and I think many people who had read it believed was an absolute work of genius. Um, I had read the play and, and, and loved it, and I said to Brian, uh, I want to do it at the Abbey. I want to produce it at the Abbey. And he was reluctant. He sort of, oh, no, 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 no. It, you know, it hadn't, wasn't a success. And, uh, you know, the Abbey's too big and we, could, we, couldn't, we couldn't do it. And, and, and we had this conversation back and forward. And then he came to me one day and he said, why don't we ask McCann if he'll do it? We asked Donald McCann if he'll, if he'll play uh, Frank Hardy. And then maybe we could do it at the Abbey. If, if, if Friel is a, is a genius, and I believe he is, um, Donald was a genius that matched him. The, the, the coming together of Donald McCann and the part of Frank Hardy was like a creation of um, the most perfect match. We opened in 1980 in the Abbey um, to the most sensational response. Absolutely, the play was discovered by an audience that really embraced it in a way that had not happened in New York. John Cavanagh and Kate Flynn were the other two roles. It, it, it was a production that I feel enormously proud of and I think was an opportunity for people to see how great an actor Donald McCann was and what a great play Faith Theater was. Way back in 1979, I went to see Brian. Actor Stephen Ray. We talked about the possibility of starting a touring company that we knew that was some money available with the Northern Arts Council. And I actually asked him for a play, and he said he was working on something, was beginning to work on something, and uh, we could have that, really. And sometime later he sent me the first act of Translations. I've, I feel particularly privileged that he sent it to me before he'd actually completed the play. You could say it was a great play. It was part and parcel of the beginning of the company, but in a way the company became the play, the play became the company, the concerns of that play, language, identity, uh, attitude to history, myth, a whole range of areas that were of interest to Freel became the concerns of the company and of our our board, including Seamus Heaney, Seamus Dean, Tom Kilroy, Tom Paul, and all the people who came on board with us. These became our concerns and... uh, we were, without question, a company that were that were about ideas, and we, I think we created a theatre that um, that was a theatre of ideas, a theatre of debate, and that really came from the first production, Translations. I think the communication cord was written as a sort of antidote to the reception that uh, Translations had received, um, the euphoric reception and the sense that somehow or other in Translations... Brian had written a play that would bring the two parts of the country together and bring Ireland and England closer together. And I don't think that was what he meant at all in, in, in writing translations. I mean, if you look at the third act of translations, it's, it's, uh, it's very bleak. And it uh, sort of really does not talk about reconciliation. It talks about the fact that when you get too close, uh, when, when the two sides got too close, the Donnelly twins or their equivalent moved in and they kill Yolland and and it's now essential for Moira who's fallen in love with him to actually emigrate so the play I think was somewhat bewilderingly seen as a a play about how the two cultures um, the Irish and the English culture could actually reconcile when I think I think I think he meant something entirely different Um, so communication code was written as a sort of a farce to try and kind of balance that and show the the um uh, the, the, the kind of nonsense of cultural uh, exploration in this way. I, I, I don't think it was a successful play. I think it, it didn't really work because it was written in, in a way, as I say, to, to, to be a, a counterbalance to what is a great play. Translations is a, is a masterpiece. And so this farce, um, a form that I really don't believe... Um, Friel is is um, a master of uh, the Monday scheme many years earlier and the communication court, two farces that 
for my money, don't quite um, resonate and don't quite have the the um, the kind of res- relentless logic and that farce needs. The second time I worked with Brian Friel was in Making History, which was a fascinating play. And uh, the part I played, of course, was that of um, Archbishop Lombard, who was uh, not a cardinal, but he was the equivalent of a cardinal in Irish terms at that time. It was received very, very well in some places and not very well in others. The most amazing thing about it was that when we did a revival of it in the Cottesloe in London, it was absolutely ecstatically received. And there's no other word for it. They really went for it. And um, it sort of was a great boost for me personally because I I felt that I'd done well there. And... Um, but but they they really loved it, you know, much more so I think than 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 here. I, I've done two of Brian's adaptations of Turgenev, Fathers and Sons, and A Month in the Country. A Month in the Country, it, it's a superb adaptation of the play because he manages to combine the very real emotional world of of uh, Natalia and who and and uh, her falling madly, passionately, ridiculously and. And insanely in love with this with this young student, um, the fact that it's a month in the country and that all everything takes place in a very short space of time, that it's a really beautiful summer's day all the time, the whole sense of atmosphere that that he creates in the play, and then he peoples it not only with this central story that's really compelling, but with these amazing um, subsidiary characters. I mean, Herr Schaff, the German, you've got. Um, Bolchinsov, the old um, land uh, owner who comes to court, young Vera, who's only 15. You've got um, Dr. Spigelski, this marvellous character that we had in the Gate production that I did. We had um, uh, Donald McCann play Dr. Spigelski. I mean, um, these just rich creations, not just taken um, from a translation of the Turgenev, but recreated and rethought in a way that made them most original. Um, the mother-in-law developed and built up by Brian um, into a major character in the play. And Mikhail, the, 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 the observant, the watchful, the man who's in love with Natalia, but who can, that, that love can never really be explored. It's, it's rich, it's fabulous narrative, great characters. Um, I think the fact that Brian finds that, that Irish world in the midst of the Russian, and because characters like Matvi and, and um, uh, the young maid, Katya, um, both of them are, are pure Irish peasantry in the play, and it feels very Irish, as well as never losing the spirit of the original. Um, he's a brilliant, brilliant um, translator of both Chekhov and Turgenev. I mean, his three sisters that he did, um, together with those Russian, those other, and the Vankovania that he did, he he just has the gift of being able to to listen to those texts and and recreate them in a way that makes them highly original and yet true to their original to the to to, to their original origins. I'd never uh, actually directed a Brian Friel play, although I knew Brian and had seen all his plays um, at the Abbey through the 70s and and in, in, in the 80s. Patrick Mason directed the Tony Award-winning Dancing at Lunasa, which opened at the Abbey Theatre in April 1990. When I was reading the, the script of Lunasa for the first time, Brian's uh, Friel's stage directions are extraordinarily detailed. Who dances, in what order they dance, how they dance, the the, the character of their dance. And I thought, this is an interesting one now. You know, this is extraordinary. And I thought, how strange that it comes in the middle of Act One. Because usually uh, you'd think this sort of big moment, big musical moment, would be some kind of climactic end of an act or end of the play, or indeed some sort of great celebration, as indeed they, in, in, when they made the movie of it, they made the, the dance the sort of big final number and then you realized exactly why Brian Friel had put it in the middle of the first act <laughs> because uh, and I didn't see it at first you see there's 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 the genius of the man and, and I said are you sure now and he said I think you'll find <laughs> that I think you'll find it's in the right place and yeah sure enough there it was because it it, it comes at you 
sort of, in, in one sense, it comes out to you out of nowhere, but it lifts the whole play onto a completely different level. And from then on, for the rest of the evening, you, 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 you never kind of, you can never go, as it were, back on yourself. You, you, you now know what is going on in this house. You know what is at stake. You know what lies under every word and every deed that then happens for the rest of the evening. And although you never see the, the sisters dance again, of course there are the other dance sequences with the um, uh, Jerry Evans and, and the, the sort of Fred Astaire stuff, it, it's always in, you know resonating in the back of your head for the rest of the evening, and it's 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 the mark of a genius playwright that that, that, that you know the calculation is so exact, and it is so effective. I was in the uh, original production of uh, Wonderful Tennessee. It was the play that came immediately after Dancing at Lunasa. Um, it's very interesting for lots of reasons, but of course there were huge expectations, the wrong expectations on the play. People wanted Dancing at Lunasa. That's what they expected, and it was. Nothing like Dancing at Lunasa. It's a, it's a much more difficult play in many ways. It's a bleak play. Um, these characters are waiting, longing, hoping. And it's, it's unfulfilled, you know. They don't, they don't achieve where they're going. Maybe that's the point. You know, you never get there. You're, you're left on, on the pier. But there's, there is a sense of maybe reconciliation, of a possibility of going forward. Molly Sweeney was an extraordinary experience, partly because Brian himself directed, and I think, if I'm not right in saying, it was the first time he'd ever directed. Mark Lambert played Frank in the first production of Molly Sweeney, directed by Brian Freel at the Gate in 1994. The language and the poetry of, of the piece, uh, and the character itself, Again, that's fundamental in Brian's writing. It never becomes, although it may be beautiful language and elegiac at times and uh, uh, moving, it, the characters that you are playing are always three-dimensional and you can get right under the skin of each character and that's what I was able to do in M Molly Sweeney. Well, just as I was, I think, asked to, to do Dancing at Lunasa because of my interest in music and dance and, I suppose, um, non-naturalistic theatre. Uh, when it came to performances, Michael Colgan uh, was very keen that I should work again with, with Brian Friel. And Brian had become very interested in the music and the story behind the writing of the Intimate Letters String Quartet, um, Janacek as an old man, his uh, passionate affair with this married woman that had risen to this, uh, given rise to this extraordinary sort of flowering of both uh, music and and sort of letter writing. Anyway, you, you know, music is a is a real it, it's a problem on stage because the tension was: is this going to turn into a concert or is it going to be a play? Which is it going to be? And Friel would always say, no, it's a play. It's a play. It has to be a play. And we got to the, in fact, we got to the um, first preview, and I'm a great believer in saying, let us, let us work ourselves to death to get the thing as, as it is conceived. And if at the end of that, you know, it still ain't working, then let's see what we have to do. And this is what we did. And we got to the first preview, and Brian said to me, I'm wrong. It's, it's just, it's not working. And the two movements are too long at the end. And I said, well, I think you're right. I think that's actually right. It turns into a concert. And it was absolutely clear from performance that once you'd played the second movement, the last movement, though necessary musically, was dramatically not necessary. In fact, would again, tilted the evening into a, a concert rather than a play. And we looked at various ways that we might just say, well, it is a concert and play it. But we decided, and again, Friel was very strong on this, no, it has to be a play. It has to end up as a play. So we took out that movement. Uh, and, I, and I think it, it, it did work very well. It became a play. Uh, it's been done since, and uh, they simply played the quartet first, and then they did the play. And that is a way we actually thought of doing it, that you know, the first half of the movement, uh, first half of the evening would be the quartet, and then you'd hear the play plus bits of the quartet. 
Um, but it's a fascinating thing, this, of, of how, uh, you know, music sometimes can be so strong on, on, on stage as part of a drama, and then suddenly it can start taking over. And the, the music, you know, well, you have to make a choice. Are you going to just make this a concert or a recital, or is it going to be a drama? One of the particular pleasures of, of playing in a Friel premiere is that Brian Friel would be around quite a lot and uh, occasionally gave notes. Actress Dervla Crotty played Margaret in The Home Place, Friel's most recent play produced at the gate in 2005. But the notes were really of a musical quality and so he would draw our attention to the duet quality, for example, in a, a dialogue. And so that particular thing of listening and responding and refrain and all of those musical ideas. And then when you might have five or six people with with each person contributing something, the quality again is very different. And always inviting us to contemplate the music of what we were saying, which isn't at all to say that we would speak in musical tones or um, any sort of lyricism. And if something blunt was called for, of course, that's what you... And uh, I think also in the home place, the fact that you've got so many different accents, you know, you have a, the Donegal accent of, if you like, the natives. Uh, and then you've got Christopher Gore and his son, who are also natives, but who speak with... English accents or received pronunciation and of course the visitors, the English visitors. And finally, Friel's own opinion on the making of a piece of theatre. Well, I mean, I have a kind of an old-fashioned attitude to this that I, um, I mean, I look on, uh, on the, the script as a kind of uh, score which has got to be interpreted with, with great, with great um, attention to detail and um, no liberties must be taken with it. This is a very ancient notion of how, how a script should be handled. Uh, but once the play has been done, once it has been interpreted, I, I kind um, this is another personal thing. I don't, um, I don't feel as protective about it anymore. I mean, the, the very first production of Translations was something that exercised me greatly, and, and uh, I give complete attention to it. But once it has been, once the play has been done, uh, I don't feel the same uh, care or concern about it. The playwright in profile was Brian Freel. The contributors were Ingrid Craigie, Derv Lacrotti. Joe Darling, Gary Hines, Mark Lambert, Patrick Mason, Stephen Ray and Neil Tobin. And you heard Freel himself in programmes with Ivan Boland, John Bowman and Des Hickey. Playwrights in Profile was compiled and presented by Sean Rocks and produced by Kevin Reynolds. I began writing when I was about 18 or 19, and uh, whether it made me or I made it, I just don't know which happened. You know? Brian Friel was born in Tyrone in 1929. His father was a Derry school teacher, his mother a postmistress from Glenties in County Donegal. Friel has spoken little about his work and less about his life. In 1970, however, Ivan Boland asked him about the early years. Was the Tyrone you grew up in uh, an unsettled place, or was it... Uh a society where a Catholic could live easily? Well, I left there when I was 10 years of age, uh, reared in a very traditional Catholic nationalist um, home. Uh, I came to Derry in 1939 when war was beginning, and uh, we believed then that um, Germany was right and that England was wrong, you know, this kind of an attitude. Friel's secondary school education was at St. Columns College in Derry. He went on to work as a teacher in and around the city, writing short stories throughout the 50s and some stage works in the early 60s. The real breakthrough, however, came after a trip to Tyrone Guthrie's Theatre in Minneapolis. I first saw Philadelphia Here I Come in the 1964 production by Hilton Edwards with uh, Donald Donnelly and Patrick Clay. Um, so when when it played in New York in that original production, of course, it was it was a sensational success. And so to bring it back, as I had the opportunity to do in the early 90s in, in, in New York, and then subsequently I did a production of it at the Guthrie Theatre, where um, uh, indeed Brian had been um, Tyrone Guthrie's observer. He'd been an observer at the very first season here in 1963, Brian um, uh, came from Ireland and spent the summer here uh, when Guthrie was putting his first season together. And he wrote to me when, Brian, when we were uh, mounting the play in my first season here in 1996. And he said uh, in that that he had gone home from the Guthrie Theatre 
Anna Guthrie High and written Philadelphia, Here I Come. So in so many ways, when I did it um, at the Guthrie as part of my first season, it felt like bringing the play home, where he had conceived it and where, it had, uh, where, where on a Guthrie high he had gone home and written it. Freel followed Philadelphia Here I Come with The Loves of Cass Maguire, which had its American premiere in 1966 and its Irish premiere in 1967. While Cass may not have been as successful as Philadelphia, it played an unusual role in the beginnings of an important Irish theatre company. Dined. And I went into this production in the gate with Hilton and with myself and Anna Manahan. There were there are two parts of the play, as you know. Very, very moving, of course, as well. Heartbreaking, the second part. It was really... Well, the first one is is uh, superficially heartbreaking as well as being heartbreaking, but the second one is, is very, very moving, I think, and uh, I loved playing it. In 1973, Freel turned to matters of an overtly political nature in the freedom of the city. At the time, he spoke with Des Hickey about this perceived change of emphasis. Well, I suppose uh, on a kind of superficial level, it would appear to be a more... Um, in quote social play it, it would appear to have more to do with an immediate situation which is political and uh, in a way revolutionary but I, th- I think that uh, this is only a kind of superficial look at the theme because it really has to do with um, people who are in a sense um, dispossessed uh, and I think this kind of theme can be traced back in earlier plays I've written as well Is this though a theme that you have um, avoided before Well, I avoided in a kind of way um, using immediate political happenings um, uh, and grabbing headings from newspapers in that sense. Bedford and Eamon Kelly and Maureen D. O'Sullivan and um, and a wonderful, wonderful Irish cast. Current artistic director of the Guthrie Theatre, Joe Dowling. That production was my introduction to Brian Friel and I think many people's introductions to Brian Friel, though he had written a couple of plays before. Um, it was it it broke so many of the of the the moulds of Irish dramatic literature. I mean, we had all become used to the idea of the kitchen drama, the 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 Abbey play, where the the um, housekeeper and the priest and and the postmaster and all the various characters would come in, and and there would be a sense of of absolute naturalism about it. And what Friel did with with Philadelphia, I come in creating those two characters. I mean, Gar private and Gar public, both aspects, different aspects of the one man, um, was to absolutely turn the Irish country cottage play on its head. Um, it also, of course, struck a chord, a deep, deep chord in the Irish people because emigration had been and continued in 1964 and right through up till fairly recently to be a major, major part of Irish life. So many people had to emigrate and go abroad and never came back. I mean, the whole notion of the, of the American wake that's so extraordinary in, in, in Brian's play. Well, um, Brian Friel is, is responsible, um, whether he likes it or not, and I'm sure he doesn't, for my introduction into the theatre. Artistic Director of Druid, Gary Hines. When I joined Drama Sock in, in uh, UCG in 1971, I had been bitten with the idea of directing uh, by that stage. And so I went up to the UCG library and I went to the plays for the first time and I ferreted around there and I eventually pulled out this play called The Loves of Cass Maguire and I was immediately captivated by the play. I was immediately captivated by the fact that he broke the fourth wall, that the character talked to the audience, that characters uh, entered and emerged to the audience, that other characters broke in, that Cass broke in on other scenes and just simply, I just found it tremendously exciting. So you know, with all the naivety of a 19 or 20 year old, which I was at the time, I said, that's the play I'm going to do. Well, I have a very special affection and feeling for Brian Friel for a very simple reason. Actor Neil Tobin. It was when I was offered the part of Andy in Lovers. I was a member of the staff of the RTE rep. I just read this play and I said, well, I, I've got to do it. And uh, I was told I wouldn't be given permission to come out and do it. So I said, well, to hell with it. And I, re- 